Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast, the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT to discuss their lives, their journeys and their ambitions with the greatest motorsporting event in the world and the greatest motorsporting pundit is right next to me now. Would you class yourself as a pundit, Steve, or not? Expert? Legend? Enthusiast. Enthusiast. Yeah, I think that's probably uh, in my mind anyway. One thing I forgot to mention on previous episodes is the uh, the virality of the video of you stood at trackside in your little Buzz Lightyear outfit at, at last year's, at, well, at this year's TT just gone by. <laughs> I think a good 17 million people have seen that by now. Yeah, I mean, hey, it was genuine. Yeah, I was <laughs> genuinely <laughs> frightened. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could tell. Talking about Jenny, see what I said? That beautiful segue, right? My journey. Yeah, I should be, I, you know what, I should be in TV with segues like that. But yes, the guest today, Jenny Timmouth. We had her on the, the, the TT preview, and she's been doing some fantastic work over at the TT for the uh, the radio. But it'd be interesting to, to actually get her to sit down now and, and find out more about Jenny's life and how she got into racing. You looking forward to this one? I am, mate. I know very little, really, about uh, Jenny's history. You know, how she got into racing, or well, motorcycling in general, but she's a massive uh, motorcycling fan as well as a very fast lady around a TT course. Can we also just say that that, that, that it, we, it's not like we don't do our research on these people. It's just that obviously not everybody has their whole Palmares or their CV out there for people to find out about. So it's, you know, for, especially for me, you want to come in with enough information so I don't sound like a dunce. But at the same time, it's always nice and interesting to actually find out during the podcast. To learn. To learn, yeah. No, I'm, I'm with this. Any kind of... Um interviewing that i do i like to learn an x amount and that way it's kind of uh, more interesting yeah especially with her uh, hollywood antics as well lucky lady yeah shall we get her on let's get her in jenny timmouth welcome to the tt podcast now we normally start the podcast with the same question that we ask every ex rider or rider that's been to the tt as you're rolling through no man's land or no woman's land or no, no, no gender land. Just, just Be that empty careful. space. Just that empty space between your mechanic saying "see you later" and then rolling up to the guy who's going to grab you on the shoulder. What's it feel like once you get that tap on the shoulder and you head down Glen Crutchery Road? Well, I guess initially it's quite odd to have somebody stood next to you on the start line because if you do, like you know, we've been racing for quite a few years before you get to the TT, you don't normally have somebody stood next to you, yeah. do you, at the start of a race? So initially it was quite. It was quite odd, but then I found it quite reassuring to have him there. You know, it's quite nice actually having somebody with their hand on your shoulder before you set off. Like, it's just... Yeah. Pop off, off you go. <laughs> yeah. Nerves? Excitement? What, uh, what's going through your head? Once you, definitely once you got to that point, I think the nerves have gone then. You're, you kind of get into your own race kind mm-hmm. of zone and you're thinking about what you're going to do and you're basically looking for the flag to drop and get ready to go. You know, you, you definitely go into race mentality of a, a race start like you would normally. And yeah. You're just thinking about... What, what you can see ahead of you, what points you want to hit from this from the start and then just waiting for the flag to drop to go, really. I suppose it's a different kind of start, really, because because you are starting on your own, so there's no one to, to compare yourself with how good your start's been. When you're in a mass start, you know if you've had a good start pretty much instantly, but the start isn't that detrimental. As long as you don't store the bike, it's not actually... You yeah. don't need the best start in the world, do no, you? No, it's funny because you do go into your natural... <clears throat> um, like muscle memory of what you would do at a race start and you're really keen and you're like, yeah. right, and then you're like, oh, maybe don't like fire off quite at that speed because you don't and want what, to burn out like, your clutch. What, or... what is that like? What is Jenny Timmouth like? Obviously, you've raced a lot of short circuit British super bikes, you know, which is massive. Yeah. You know, and a lot of fast, very aggressive um, male riders as well, you know. Um, but what what is Jenny Timmouth like behind the visor? Do you get really hyped up? Do you get the hump? <laughs> um, the hump? Yeah, do you get mad? Oh. oh, I think so. Yeah, when you're in a race situation, you do, don't you? Because you you want to do well, and if something's not going your way, or somebody's tried to have you off, you know, you do. You do. The red mist definitely comes down. But yeah. I like to think I'm a little bit calmer than the guys. And I, I I thought about that a little bit. You know, if I can use that to my advantage and not be too, because you've got to be, you know, you've got to rev yourself up, but you've also not got to over rev yourself mm. and keep a little bit of calmness to what you're doing. So. Do you think yeah. that helps you with the TT then? Because again, it's 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 a, it's a place where you can't go into it like with the red mist down. You have to get yourself into it, build up with the TT. And, and normally, the more relaxed you are, the faster you end up going. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be, yeah, like you say, more relaxed, and you can't have the red mist down because you yeah. you can't be 
on the limit, you know, short circuit racing, you're completely on the limit and you're happy to send it <laughs> anywhere. But yeah, the Alamon, you've definitely got to be a lot calmer and more uh, thoughtful. And why? You know, um, I want to say why. There aren't that many ladies that go and compete the TT. You know, in, in my time, when I first started racing, it was Sandra Barnett, you know, and obviously yeah. Marie Costello. And, um, and there are other, obviously, uh, females that have raced TT course, but what what attracted you in the first place? Um, I think it was just, it was a thing. I was just going to do it, I think, because I started racing. Um, so I worked in a, in a workshop at Bill Smith Motors, and obviously he raced at the Isle of Man. One of my first sponsors was Charlie Williams. Um, so obviously he's oh, well, yeah. Alaman racer. Legend. Yeah. Uh, Tim Leach done the Alaman. So I was kind of, I was in amongst it. And mm. I started my career racing when I was at Bill Smith's. And he had, for instance, um, 2000, he had a load of, I think it was Argentinians or New Zealanders in the back of the workshop. They come over for the TT. He, spo he sponsored them with bikes and they were all set up in the back of the workshop. They'd bought a bus that they were <laughs> going to use to go over with and they bought a scooter and they were nice. rattle canning it, you know, in the, in the car park. So just all around the whole racing environment was always it was short circuit racing and it was tt it was just a thing it was just a part it was like when i whenever i felt competent enough um i was gonna go so yeah so it was never it was never off the table it, it wasn't you it, you it's because again a lot of people who we've spoken to go short circuit racing and then kind of go what's this alaman tt and then they go and see it for the first time and like Shit, i want a piece of that but with you no family history of being at the tt though uh, of motorcycles in general or not? Um, so my dad had bikes, you know, right. he was into his motorbikes, not, no racing background. Mm. Um, but the bike side definitely comes from my dad. You know, we, me and my brothers as youngsters, we used to go to AGS and match his owners club rally annually. On, nice. Yeah, August. And it was great, you know, like six years old, having a, a holiday and amongst a load of old classic bikes, you know, loved it. And it was oh, just... I thought you meant they was new then. <laughs> Way back. <laughs> That's my <Yuri>, right? Yeah, <laughs> <I can> tell. <laughs> so it was always always the case that you were going to get into motorbikes then if you died. Yeah, it's just dad had a bike to commute to work. Mum had a bike which dad actually used to, as his commute, and then he, he bought a um, CB550, CB550X, I think it was. And yeah, she's always around bikes, you know. So when I was 17, I was 16, 17, I was like, well. I'm going to get a bike because that's what you do. It's like normal. Was it, I'm going to get a bike to go racing or was it just, I'm going to get a bike to go on the road and then... Initially, it was just to get a bike um, for on the road. Mm. And then, but I was already a massive race fan, you know. I loved Formula One and uh, World Superbikes and British Superbikes. So I was already keen on motorsport anyway. So what era are we there? Where, what year are we? Like 90s. Oh, right. Yeah. So foggy. Yeah, foggy. Um, John Kaczynski. Yeah. That... Troy Corsa. Yeah. And then tells on, I guess, to a degree. And then British Pretty Championship was, was the Hodgie and Chris Walker battle, you know. Yeah. I remember going to Donington to watch that when Chris's bike blew up and I was gutted for Chris. And just, <laughs> well, I love British Championship, so I was well into the whole lot. So. Massive race fan and then progressed into racing from riding on the roads. Yeah, so uh, working at Bill Smith's, obviously, I'd, I had no idea how to start racing, absolutely no idea. And um, I loved blasting around the roads. So yeah. I used to work as a glass collector in the evening and... When I'd finish work, it'd be like half 11, midnight, and the roads would be dead quiet. Perfect. Yeah, I'd just go yeah. out for a little cheeky blast. And when, when, you, <laughs> when you say you, you was a glass collector, were you mind sweeping or were you, <laughs> were you earning money? <laughs> hey, what's mind sweeping? <laughs> Drinking all the drinks and getting getting yourself... <laughs> what? Getting yourself merry on everybody else's leftovers. And for getting paid for it. You know, that little bit left in the bottom of the glass, bang, 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 bang. You never heard that tip, mind sweeping? No. God, flipping. Is that what you used to do? Definitely no, she not. can't have because she was riding a bike afterwards. <laughs> Responsible adult. Steve right? obviously did things. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. And he wasn't even a glass collector. You knew what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, from there, just... Yeah, so I asked um, Jim, who was working as a mechanic, just because he was racing as well, I just said to him, how do I... What do I do? How do I start mm. racing? So he's, he said, here's an ACU form. You need to fill that in. Get your licence, start off as a novice. Um, luckily, Bill was running track days at Anglesey. So right. I got to get on track for free I just um I was I basically trained to be a mechanic at college and then saved up got a job at Bills saved up um, money for a year to get VFR 400 nice. and took that on the on the track days at Anglesey yeah and yeah went from there got wrote my um filled in my ACU license sent that off got my novice bib and then just jumped on on the track days with Bill and then did my first races um at Anglesey how yeah. was that first race sat on the line it was you know, great. Ready, I, was, I was so keen. I was just 
<laughs> I couldn't wait, you know, when I, every time I did a track day, because I, I used to go on, on the road a little bit, sort of thinking I'm going to be a racer, when I'm going to be a racer, and I used to practice, so to actually be on a track was just the best thing in the world. I remember walking across the track at Alton Park and stopping halfway across and going, wow, I'm, I'm on, Al- <laughs> I'm stood on Alton Park, <laughs> that's how keen ah. I was. Um, do yeah. You, do you remember your first time on track? Yeah. Um, Got to be Cadwell, right? It was Cadwell Park, yeah. It was on a VFR 400 on the race schools then. Um, it was great. On the, on the club circuit, yeah, it was club circuit at Cabo Park, yeah, brilliant. And it just little VFR 400 Honda in on, in Castro colours and, you know, and I'd only been riding on the road for a couple of years. It was flipping great. Being on a track and seeing that tarmac and knowing that no one else is out on there, a wide piece of tarmac that you know you're going to get on and jump on and on, go on on a bike and have no, like that much, thinking about that and then going to the TT as well. You think of a, a real A road, no one's on it. You've got that whole 37 miles to yourself. It's a strange feeling, isn't it? It does feel wrong, doesn't it? It's like completely illegal. Or it should, <laughs> should be. <laughs> well, TT wise? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I've, not, I've never really thought about it like that. I suppose, but just because you love it so much, you know, and it's, it's, and I think I've never really thought of that purely because you're always thinking about all the, not negatives, but where you're not good enough and where the bits you can't remember quite so well and just where you're trying to improve all the time, I suppose, but yeah. But you must have thought at some point, half an hour ago, Dave was driving his bus up here and now we're going down it at 170, 180 mile an hour. Yeah, I'd probably... For me, I, I never really thought like that. Uh, I probably did at places like Macau, yeah, because it's a little bit different out there, and as you know, you're always scared of someone being left down and maybe on on the surface from mm. the cars and the vehicles. And everything. But TT so well, so well run and looked after. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Oh. Competitive, yeah. Steve. That's the thing I think, isn't it? That's probably why. Yeah, yeah. just on, on a bit of a mission, but yeah. First time on track, then first race. How did we do? Like, was it a it, baptism did, of fire did, or? my own but then I I soon realized that my bike was monumentally uncompetitive because <laughs> it was it was everyone said I just took a standard bike I literally took a standard bike I, yeah. I take I had the road fairings on it my road tires um I because I was Get so out. road tires yeah I was so naive I thought literally I'll just ride as hard as I can all I need is a motorbike and as long as it's got some tires on it any tires yeah that's all do. I need yeah um and I, I yeah it was a massive realization it would be uncompetitive because everyone had different gearing they had tuned engines yeah they had you know better tires i mean i remember i had the, I only had that one set of tires that was on the bike when i bought the bike second hand. <laughs> that was it and um they wouldn't let me through scoots near because i'd basically worn the right side of the tire to bold and i begged for them to let me through <laughs> um, really? yeah and i raced and i crashed on that tire <laughs> it's my first crash oops uh, but then at, at that point i thought at well, your first meeting no, it was probably three meetings in the same tyres. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got that tyre because I'm quite proud of that tyre. So did you, every time, <laughs> yeah. every time you went to a race, did you have to argue with the scrutineer and saying, I thought you said, through? Uh, sorry, because I thought you said something about a tyre, you're going to use it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't have, I had no money. I literally, I'd saved up for a year for this bike. and That's, all, the, that's yeah, the budget you had for the bike. Exactly. And I just, so naive, like joyfully naive, you know, just absolutely love it, living the dream, but with no clue yeah um, yeah and at that point because i realized my, my bike was just so slow and i thought there's no point i'll flick this bike up i sprayed it in my back garden in red bull red bull ducati colors <laughs> <laughs> put, fill, put some filler in the tank <laughs> sprayed it up um and sold it on and then um luckily enough uh somebody who built a good friend of bill smith's bill apparently owed him a little bit of money and bill had a little one two five in his showroom for sale um I think it was only like 800 quid bike, but because, um, so a guy called Ian Quayle, um, so he sponsored me with the bike. He billowed in the money, gave him the bike to give to me. So I had a little, um, a little 125 to, to race on after the 400. And how was that? It was great, just because it was a little actual proper little race bike. Because yeah. I thought my road bike is just not a race bike, you know. And the one, the RS125 is a little proper little GP mm-hmm. race bike, and I loved it. It was brilliant. So then I went from 400s to the 125s. Well, how, what kind of a shift is that? Because again, normally when you hear people talk, they'll go, "I started in one two five, or I started at four hundred, then I moved up to six hundred. But you're moving, you're moving back. Yeah, I mean, if anything, the one two five is actually faster, faster than four hundred. Yeah. yeah, and 
Um, it was great because it just taught me on my race craft, you know, to keep the corner speed and how to get the best from the bike. And then very much about bike setup as well, because you had to be critical with your gearing and fueling and getting your, doing the plug chop thing and getting yeah. your main jet right and your needle level and all of that. So it taught me a huge amount, you know, about. And how was it then? Obviously, you know, when, when you're kind of setting off on the 400 and then the 125 and who were the pit crew? Who looked after you? Who helped you? Um, so to start with, it was me and my mum. Um, so mum used to come with me and we used to, it used to be car and a trailer. So the bike would be on the back of a trailer and then it went with a tent and then it went from, my cousin had a little midi van. So we borrowed the van. So me and mum used to go in the van. But dad, come, dad came a few times as well and my brother came a couple of times as well, but Mostly mum would be the one that would get up at five in the morning and come with me. Oh, yeah. So, me yeah, and then I remember a good story at Cadwell Park. I, I um, run the crank out, my 125, and the, the paddock's so helpful. You know, I I didn't have a spare crank and um, Nathan Pallet, his dad, lent me a crank and me, there's a picture of me and mum out the back of the midi van with the back of it. Mum asleep in the back of it. There's nothing in there. It's just a plain van. And I'm resting on a towel as I just put the rebuilt the engine out on the grass at, in Cad Cadwell Park to put this new crank in so I could race the next day. Bloody hell. And you, and you raced? Yeah, you got it back got, together? Yeah, I got it back together and raced the next day. And it's just because the, the paddock's so nice. Yeah. You know, everyone wants to see everybody out there and they'll, everyone will rally around to give you bits and pieces mm -hmm. so you can get back out. And that was, you know, club racing is just that level. It's just so great, you know. Yeah, yeah I loved it, you know. Yeah. No money, no idea, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and at that point, did you feel like you could actually take it somewhere? I always was there know, aspirations of going yeah, there places? No, it's, it's bizarre. There's absolutely no doubt. There was just, I had such determination. I just, and I think the, the naivety was a good thing because I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. I just had the dream and a desire to do something that I really, really enjoyed. So. And what was the goal? Super, well, British Superbikes, totally. Always. Yeah. Was British. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point did we go from, uh, from, from club racing to, to stepping up a level? To, um, to kind of na national level of, of racing. So I, obviously I didn't want to step up until I thought I was good enough. And But I always wanted to put myself in a bigger pond to get better faster. Mm -hmm. So I did two two years at club level. I won a few races, so I did. I thought, oh, I'm I'm all right. I'm yeah. half decent. I needed to progress my bike. My, I think my bike was a 95. It was, all, or 92, it was old bike anyway, and I needed a newer bike. So I sold that bike, put a bit of money to it, got a newer bike, Um and then did some MRO championships. So it was the era where all the British lads were doing the MRO. So mm -hmm. you'd have the British champion in the MRO and even Casey Stoner, that's when Casey Stoner came over. So Casey was in it and it was... And the MRO, massive... sorry, Jenny, the MRO was like this, the, the step below BSB at yeah. that point. Yeah, it was it? like a national yeah. race series. Just yeah, sorry. Just yeah. tear down from, from British champion, yeah. really. Yeah, sorry, Jenny. Go on. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's like 50 on the grid. It's huge grids and really, really good depth of field, you know, competitive-wise. Um, so I sort of cut my teeth in that you know just learn I mean I, start, I was right at the back for the first few races and then gradually building up and building up mm. to get better and better and then I had my eyes I already had my eyes on British 125 championships we used to go Alton Park's my local track so we used to go and watch British Superbikes and I was, I was watching the 125s trying to judge where I would be because obviously I, I want to be good enough to qualify firstly because obviously there's a cut-off limit to actually even getting on the grid you've got to be 107% of the fastest man yeah. so and then just judging where I'd be and be like, oh, I think I could beat them. And, I think I... <laughs> and just trying to suss it out. So I went from MRO in, so two, yeah, two years of 125, so 2000, 2001, and then 2002, sorry. And 2003, I got into British Championship. So again, I sold the, the later 125 I had, bought a newer 125. And um, I joined PR Racing, actually. So PR Racing were running Gordon Blackley and Superbike. So mm -hmm. they just, the Liverpool-based teams are quite close to me. And they just said, yeah, come along with us. So I kind of, again just all green and new to it I didn't know anybody I didn't know what I was doing so they sort of helped me Gordon was great you know Gordon just took me up to see Fred Clark he took me up to see all the organizers and just introduced me to everybody and um yeah so that was that was great so yeah 2003 I moved so what what when you say you moved with those guys what what does that entail does that entail you still paying for your own bikes or yeah it's still my own my they're own just bike. looking after you and yeah, I'm literally helping just you out. having their own and yeah right. and they're just showing me the ropes yeah kind yeah. of yeah but yeah, still my own bike, still just, um, at that point, um, Steve Bradley started coming with me. So Steve worked for Bill Smith. He was a workshop foreman at Bill Smith. So he started uh, coming racing with me. So it was uh, fundamentally the team was me and Steve at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and results wise, how did we start progressing did, from there? Yeah, I did. First year was a massive learning curve. And then again, I had that stupid monumental determination of wanting to win. And 
2004, I had a great year. 2004, I got in the lead of a British championship race. Again, I, I never had new tyres at that point either. I was still on second-hand tyres. Never had new tyres? No, I couldn't afford the tyres. So I was always done that scrap pile. The best ones you can pick out of the scrap pile. Can yeah. I have those, please? <laughs> <laughs> and that, I'm really, really proud of that race because I I was 19th on the grid. It had been, it had rained, so the track was half wet, half dry. Where's this, sorry? Uh, Brands Hatch. Right. Um. It, all, it, it goes back to, I, I rocked up to Donington test day and I was late. I didn't have any wets on wheels, so I went straight out on slicks on a damp track. And then I thought, well, I might as well stay out and learn to ride on a damp track. So it gave me loads of confidence. So this race at Brands Hatch, because it was half wet, half dry, I'd already had the confidence on the slicks. So yeah. I was on the second hand set of tyres at Golf Dunlop, slick tyres. But I had that little bit of knowledge of damp conditions on slicks. And yeah. I got from 19th to 1st and led it. But... Um, with no, like, I just wanted to, you know, there was no, oh, hang on a minute, I'm in the lead. But I I thought I could, you know. Yeah. Unluckily, unluckily, I crashed out <laughs> eventually. You didn't have, that, you didn't yeah. have enough experience Yeah, <laughs> eventually I crashed because I was in the lead and wanted to keep the lead. But um, I was just, one of the best races of my life, you know, just because of everything, because it was just us two, it was just a little team. I had second-hand tyres, never had new tyres at that point, and just the whole scenario, I was over the moon with it you know and I got a round of applause from a bit later when I came back in and <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah and then from there I um I dislocated my collarbone at um Knock Hill another wet race I made a bad start and did you have wets by then yeah I right. was on wets but I, I made such a bad start and I was like well I want to be at the front again I want to be leading and I remember I just gave it a massive handful um high sided myself <laughs> dislocated my collarbone which I thought was broken because it was so painful and then was still I was so furious because I was like, well, I've only got two weeks before the next round at Mallory and I want to be fit. And luckily I passed the medical for Mallory and then I got my first ever championship points at Mallory. So, yeah, 2004 was a good year. Yeah. Yeah. And then 2005 was a disaster because I had, had, from having not much money to having absolutely no money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say from having not much money to having <laughs> low juice. Having yeah. too much money. I had nothing. 2005 was awful. I, I begged, borrowed, every, like, p- pistons, chains my crank cases were actually split into three halves by the end of the season because of it and what were you still working at bill smith uh, no so we'd I... left bill smith that's why i had no money all <laughs> oh, right um, well, what were you doing so me and brad decided to set up our own workshop so uh we started our we called two-wheel workshop we set up in 2005 so um uh, more just so we could have a bit more time to go racing because it was it was harder to go racing having a full-time job because they would when new registrations came out, you had to be in the workshop and you mm-hmm. couldn't have the weekend off to go racing. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we went our own way with that. And obviously setting that up. Cost um, money, yeah. Yeah, we didn't have anything left, <laughs> but still wanted to go racing. So. And did you manage to get in, get out racing in 2005? Yeah. So you did a little bit? Yeah, but it was, oh, my bike was ridiculously slow because I had a, I basically had a crack where the reed valve goes on the back of the mm-hmm. crankcases. I had a crack in the, where the reed valve sat so it would suck in uh, and I kept getting welded um, and welded and welded and the crap was getting bigger and bigger and welded and welded. And by the last round, it was so ridiculously slow. And yeah, the last round, it just, the crankcase actually just fell into three pieces. <laughs> Listen, you, you, you talk the same as any racer. You always had the slowest bikes. And... No, but it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they all say. No, oh, yeah. 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 No. Me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, do you think racing's over like obviously you've got to put all your money and time into your workshop to to build that as a business um so but at any point did you feel like right i need to knock this on the head because you, you just think how is it possible to do it you know it's just so i don't have the means to do it mm-hmm. and i was um fighting the losing battle you know especially with that bike with what i had and and um we were like, there's a team called KRP that was racing at the time, and their bikes were the best. You know, yeah. They were so fast, and even if I thought I was good around the corners, <laughs> Steve's gonna laugh. But they were, they, honestly, God, they were so much faster. And I thought there's not absolutely nothing I can do. I'm, and then I thought, I'm, I don't know how to do this because it's just too hard. Yeah. But then I think the thought of it being harder makes you more determined. And, Spurred you on. Yeah, and I yeah. just got even more determined, and I thought nobody's gonna, because nobody saw. I felt like nobody sort of saw what I was doing. I thought, well, nobody's going to come and help me. You got to do it. Yourself. I've got to do it myself. Yeah. If I still want to do it, I've got to dig in even harder. So I just dug in, dug in even harder. Yeah. Dug in even harder into the credit card. No, look, <laughs> I never got a credit card because I, had, <laughs> um, like a previous boyfriend who used to race was telling me about 
how he had a massive credit card debt. So I thought, I'm not yeah. going to get myself into that. I was the same. And I was <laughs> shit on a bike. <laughs> so then at what point do we start building and, and kind of seeing the fruits of your labour in terms of racing then? So 2005 was a write-off. At what point do we start getting the bigger bikes and we start moving towards looking at the TT then? Um, so I guess I, I got stuck on 125s a little bit for 2006 and then 2007 I had a really good year again. Mm. Um, I, got, I had to go on um, Rizzler Suzuki at Mallory Park. They let me have a go on that I had John Reynolds as a mentor in 2007, so a little right. bit of connection with Rizzler Suzuki. On a super bike list. Yeah. yeah. And the great thing about that was because after watching Chris Walker at... Um, Donington in 2000 and sitting on his superbike then because yeah. I had like a wheel change competition in the paddock. It was his bike I got to race at um, Mallory Park Race of the Year in 2007. So oh, nice. that was great. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, that, that wasn't your first experience on a big bike though, or was pretty it? Pretty much, yeah. Was it? Yeah. So I, I didn't do overly great. It was a big jump from 125 Massive. to that. Yeah. Um, but you're not going to turn that, no, that down? No, I would have. I would have liked to have had more experience on big bike before I did it and made better account of, account of myself. Mm. Um, so I went back the year after when I'd done a year on 600 because then I bought my 600 in, at the end of, or beginning of 2008, I bought 600. So I'd done a year on a four stroke then. So I went back to Mallory Park, race of the year to do a better lap time, you know, to prove. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're capable yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, so yeah, answer to your question, yeah, I got um, a, a 600 in beginning of 2008. Um I just had to make the leap of faith, you know, to get to get it really. Yeah. Um, I didn't have any money to run it. I literally spent all my money buying the bike, and it was the older bike. It was the old shape um, CBR yeah. six hundred off Aaron Walker. A fantastic bike, though. It was a Tenkarte bike, unbelievably good bike. But nobody wanted it because it's the older model. So I got it for relatively cheap. Mm -hmm. And um, another story. I remember, I'd, I, like I said, I had no money to run it, and Aaron had some scrub tires. So we went to Brands Hatch. Slept in the back of the van. So it's the year that you remember when it snowed at Brands? Yeah, 2008. <laughs> so yeah. we were sleeping in the back of the van. We went all the way down there just to get these tyres. <laughs> just we, to get a pair of tyres. Yeah, and me and Brad were in the back of the van. And the snow coming in the gap of the van. We were like, what's that fluffy white stuff? <laughs> Open the door. And it's just snow everywhere. Blimey hell. So I didn't miss anything with missing that <laughs> <No>. one. <laughs> wow. So, so w let's go back to race a year for a second. Like you say, it's a massive jump between a one two five and a thousand. Do you did you jump on that bike and go? Was it wait? It was a thousand at that point, weren't it? They, they moved across to the thousands. Yeah. The, the, like too much power, far too fast, too big, too heavy. Or you're like, <laughs> this is this is the one. This is what I've been waiting yeah, for. Yeah, I guess it, I, I was. Yeah, I was. I was more disappointed that I didn't know how to ride it. I'd never right. raced on those on those massive slick tires. I didn't know how much how much they would take. I yeah. Didn't, I didn't know. Because one two five never really moves, you know. I didn't know how to feel confident with it moving. I didn't. I wasn't confident with wheelies. I wasn't confident with how far I could push. You know, I just I was more disappointed in the fact that I didn't know. I didn't know how to ride that yeah. bike. Um, I wasn't afraid of the bike or thinking it was too big. I loved it. You know, I felt at home on it straight away. I just I wanted to do. I wanted to do well, mm -hmm. and that was more. It was more that than anything. <laughs> nice. And then on onto the six hundred for the following year. Again, yeah. it's a bit of a step back. But still a step forward for the for the compared to the one two five. Yeah. And how did you enjoy riding that bike? Because I loved it. Six hundred are one of the best kind of bikes to ride, right? Yeah. Can... I've got a good story for that as well. <laughs> well, that's, that's exactly why we're here. Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> out qualified plate. <laughs> right. We'll end the we'll end the podcast right there. With Jenny out qualified to plate. Where at? No Alton, rebuttal. Alton Park. It was only qualifying <laughs> one though, so qualifying two. I wasn't. Shh, it doesn't, didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't <laughs> matter. Uh, was it wet? It was. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm taking it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yes. I'd take that all day. Oh, so that's in, are we in British Supersport then? British Supersport, yeah. So talk me through how you get into British Supersport. Because you need, you need a certain amount of money to get a certain level of bike to prove that you're good enough to take a step up to British Supersport. So who's giving you that chance to, who sees the talent in you? to give you a chance to do that? Or is this off still off your own back? Uh, still off my own back. So me and Steve again as, as team, um, my own bike, but honestly a good bike, Ten, that Tenkarte Honda, really good bike. You need some money to do that though, don't you? At that point I didn't because it came with a lot of spares. So Aaron has run it in the championship for a few mm. seasons. So it came with like four sets of spare wheels. I had all the wheels. He gave me everything. They were unbelievably generous with what what I bought yeah. off them. You know, I had all the spares. I had, 
even tank art, you have a manual with it, so how to set it up. Wow. Do this with your suspension if you feel this. Do this with the suspension. No, there's a whole yeah. Tenkati manual because Tenkati want you to do well on their bikes. Yeah. So they give you a manual on how to run it, how to set it up. So, yeah, like I said, it came with wheels. It came with a spare engine. came with lots of spares, uh, spare fairings. I had, like, the whole package of the bike and mm -hmm. all the spares I needed for the season. So in terms of that, that was that was set it was more the tires and the fuel but yeah. i just run pump fuel which i actually got put to the back of the grid once because they, they found out i was running pump fuel but Cause just i just yeah just trying to be just trying to do it Frugal, on the cheap as always on a budget yeah. Yeah. so wait so you're not allowed to use you're supposed to use uh race fuel in qualifying in the races why is that is that to control so that fuel? everybody's because control so everybody right, uses okay. the same secret surely the pump fuel is not as not as high it's octane big, right no but yeah, but if you use pump fuel, then it's difficult to control anybody that's using any Fandango fuel. All right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you sense. had to buy the fuel off of the the organisers? Yeah. Right, okay. I never knew that. All right. It's still the same now. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So you can't just rock up to the shell and just... No. Stick some in and off you go? No. All right, okay. So, again, the level of competition is going through the roof now, and you're still competitive. It was, I was in front of McGuinness and everyone, it was great. Yeah, but Jenna, she had new tyres, I didn't. <laughs> Jenny's never had a pair of new tyres in her life. Wet. They were wet, new. <laughs> and you were on slicks. But, like you say, as much as we're taking the piss out of him, like the, you're riding with the yeah, likes the of McGuinness and Plater. Yeah, like all my heroes, sort of, yeah, basically getting in their way, but wobbling around, <laughs> yeah. you know, trying to learn from, from the best, you know. And yeah, did you? Yeah, definitely. It's It's good to be in a... In that kind of field, you know, because you learn from everybody else and you, it pull, it drags you along massively. You know, it's good to go into something that's hard yeah. to get dragged along. You never felt like you were out of your depth? I felt like I was getting in apologetically, I'm sorry if I'm in your way. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, I I still had that huge ambition to, to do well and I, I was grateful I was grateful to be there and grateful to be racing against like Steve and everybody. You know, it was, it was good for me. I enjoyed it. So what was your first kind of breakthrough? You know, for a because you've you've had some good bikes and and good rides. What what was your what was your first kind of um, I don't know what best way of kind of putting it really, but helpline from a manufacturer or a team or what what was your first sort of breakthrough in, into getting some help? I guess I had a really good sponsor. Well, I've had quite a few good sponsors to be fair. I've had a lot of help. You know, um, lots of sponsors come come on board when I end of. One two five championship and then into six hundred. You know, I got, I got some good sponsors and I couldn't do it without them. You know, definitely. And then I got a really, really good sponsor for when I did make the jump into superbike. So yeah. I got um a quite a big, you know, a big sponsor that blew me away. We know how much they sponsored me, and it was I think it was a quarter of the budget they would normally spend. But to me, it was huge, um, right. and that made a massive difference. Just the the reassurance that I could buy the new tires and that I could buy if I had a big crash, I could buy spares and. That helps massively, just because you know you can push a bit hard, harder. You mean, take, you're take always pushing harder, but yeah, yeah, you know you've got a bit of a backup. You never. Does that does? I suppose it's a question for both of you, really. Does that come with added pressure that all of a sudden now you have to perform because these people are putting money into it and they're not going to carry on putting money into it if you keep stacking it? So do you did you did you feel any pressure to now start getting towards the front of the grid and be better? Um. No, I guess not because I I put a huge amount of pressure on myself because I wanted to I wanted to win you know yeah. that was I wanted to do well so the pressure was on me for from me and myself yeah for me to win they never put any pressure on for results and I I guess I have a lucky selling point that I stood out regardless so somebody who finishes twentieth maybe doesn't get noticed whereas I could finish twentieth and get noticed you know because because yeah. I'm a girl so from that point of view I had a I didn't have the pressure I didn't necessarily have the pressure to need to win to get any publicity I was getting it anyway so. From that point of view, I think sponsors were super happy, and they they did it in a as a corporate hosp hospitality kind of way. Mm -hmm. So they were um, taking you know clients to the events. And that's the main thing they wanted. You know, they just wanted to wine and dine people at, at the events, and they had a reason to do it and somebody to watch. So yeah, yeah. Did you did you feel that, Steve? No. Right, crack on. Let's move. On. No, <laughs> no, it was the same as what. But you're you with know, Jenny, Jenny you're with really, fact, like yeah. the HM plant, right? Yeah, but you you put that much pressure on yourself. Yeah, that, you know. The, I suppose maybe um, you know when you first start on a superbike when I when I first jumped on um, which was two thousand which was the foggy uh, not foggy so Hodgie and uh, Stalky gear uh, on the factory Kawasaki's but 
I suppose, you, you, you know, you're a rookie, so you're learning anyway. But then once you kind of got a foot in the door, and when I rode like the Honda, the SP2, the ex Colin Edwards World Superbike, Championship winning super bike. Um, yeah, you kind of felt a little bit of pressure then because it took me a while to get, to kind of get my head around the V twin and and the tires and so on. Mm -hmm. I had some issues before I started winning on it, but you kind of feel a bit of pressure then because that team would just come back from World Superbike, so they're obviously they're all doers and yeah. yeah so but you put that much pressure on yourself anyway, and you got the hump with yourself if you don't achieve. So it's, mm. yeah, I never really felt it from the outside. No, it's more from within. Yeah. A, a, a random question, and I know this is Jenny's podcast. Why did you have an orangutan on the back of your helmet? Uh, I, I was just thinking of the, that old school, that old school <laughs> SP SP one SP two. Came from uh, when I first rode for Honda, late nineties on Super Sport Sanyo Honda, um, the NEC, the motorcycle show. Yeah. Uh, now motorcycle live. It was a was a massive. It's still it's still massive, but back then there was always, um, you know, there'd be Colin Edwards, Aaron Slight within the Honda. Yeah. Um, there'd be a load of promotional girls as well as all the Honda staff and all the World Superbike team and so on, all staying in the same hotel, which is normally the Forest of Arden near near Birmingham. So they were big drinking nights. Um, yeah. and, I don't see where this story's going, Steve. To be honest, <laughs> and it was Slighty and Edwards taking the Mickey at me because I've got such long arms. Oh right, okay, and that's where it all stemmed from. From that. Yeah. So maybe we should start going near the orangutan. No. Back on with it. Super sport. Out qualifying the likes of Steve Plater, but feeling like you're in the way. Like Steve said, was there a watershed moment, not only for a sponsor coming on board, but that you went from going, you know, feeling apologetic for being in people's way to then going, move out of my way because I'm coming through? So I guess when I bought Steve's bike. <laughs> that always helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, I bought your Q1 the Super Sport Champion Championship in was it 2009 nine yeah and then the I basically bought your bike you you had Honda two bikes for sale afterwards plowed all the money into buying one of your your bikes and that is so just, how much how much are we how much are we talking for so that, one of those bikes that bike was 25 grand <laughs> yeah a lot of money CBR 600 again does it come with a full package. And everything you need. Well, it sort of did, and then it it actually came with something not on it that should have been on it. Tires. Uh, no, that um, just a brake uh, engine braking system. Right. That I didn't realise wasn't on it, so it wasn't quite the bike I thought thought it was, and it took a long time to realise that something was missing. And it was Sam Lewis's team that helped me put that back on, and then from that point on, I started getting result, result, results then, and then I did the Super Sport Cup on it, and I um, I finished third in the cup. I would. I, I was actually leading the cup going into the last round, but they have like a count back thing, and then I had um, a clutch issue with on the last round, so I ended up finishing third. But I was over the moon. Yeah. Finishing third. Dan Neen was second. Uh, Patrick McDougal won the championship. So you're in good company there. Yeah. So I got quite a few podiums in that in the cup and that and that was yeah that was great and that was the second year at TT then because I'd already I'd done the TT okay we'll pause the conversation right there still plenty to discuss with Jenny when it comes to the TT and Hollywood in fact check out this clip right here I remember Mission 5 there was a point where I had to get basically just get off the bike I had to get well, get on the bike put the side stand up a certain way get on the bike a certain side and then put stare at Tom Cruise in his eyes and that was that was the hardest feel. like oh. <laughs> I wanted to look away <laughs> You can watch that episode first over on TT Plus. But until then, Steve, catch you later, mate. It's been a pleasure. Always. Always.